Major funding for Election 2022 Arkansas PBS Debates is provided by AARP Arkansas with additional funding provided by the Arkansas State Chamber of Commerce. From the campus of University of Central Arkansas and the studios of Arkansas PBS, it's Election 2022. Arkansas PBS U.S. Senate Debate. Stand by Jim in five, four, three, two, one. Upon Jim and Kristen. Hello again, everyone. We're back and welcome once again to Debate Week here on Arkansas PBS. At this hour, the candidates for the United States Senate, and they are, in alphabetical order, the Republican nominee, the incumbent, Senator John Bozeman, the Libertarian candidate, Mr. Kenneth Cates, and the Democratic nominee, Natalie James. The questions for the debate will be coming from Una Lee of 4029 News, Fort Smith and Fayetteville, Christina Munoz of Natural State Update and Arkansas PBS, and I'm Steve Barnes. The rules for the debate, as always, agreed uh, to by the candidates prior to the debate. Each nominee will have one minute to respond to a question, and the candidates will have 30 seconds for a rebuttal if they choose. At the conclusion of questioning, each candidate will have one minute for a closing statement. The order of candidate appearance, questioning, all determined prior to the debate in a drawing that was overseen by the candidates themselves or their representatives. Our first question will come from Una Lee and it goes to Mr. Cates. All right, Mr. Cates, thanks so much for joining us today. Many Arkansas-based companies like Walmart and Tyson are expanding coverage for abortions out of state. Now, the Pentagon has announced that they will provide funds for troop-seeking abortions. What is your stance on abortion? Do you support this policy? I do not, Miss Lee. I am pro-life 100%. Over to Ms. James. That is a wonderful question. Right now, we're in a time where we have to trust women, trust our doctors, and trust those professionals to make the best interest for everyone. Abortion isn't just abortion. We have to use the term correctly. It is an evacuation of the uterus. So if I have a DNC and I have a failed miscarriage, and by failed means it does not fully come out, I could die and my two children that are home won't have a mother. Who's thinking about those lives? Who's thinking about the domestic violence survivors? Are those put in domestic situations where the man tells them, I know that you're pregnant, you can't leave. Who's helping those women? Right now, abortion is an international human right. It's not just the state's right to tell us what to do with our bodies. It is up for us to make sure that we have the adequate health care that we need because abortion is health care. Ms. James, thank you. Mr. Bozeman, one minute. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, I am pro-life, and as a result of that, I don't believe in abortion except for rape, incest, and the life of the mother. I also don't believe in federal funding of abortion, so if the uh, military is starting to do that, then I would be very much opposed to that. We have many taxpayers throughout the country uh, that feel the same way that I do. They don't want their taxpayer dollars used for abortions. In regard to Walmart and private country, uh, companies, I don't agree with, with them doing that, but they are private companies. They get to do what they want to. Mr. Cates, you have 30 seconds if you choose. Uh, no rebuttal, sir. All right, uh, Ms. James, to you, 30 seconds. Federal funding and federal protections are needed in this time. We are not poised to take ourselves back 50 years. We're not poised to allow our military women. We're not poised to let our employees, our Walmart employees, have back alley abortions, our inadequate health care, and access to the actual health care that they need. So we need to make sure we're thinking about what's best for the citizens and not what's best for us in our internal compass, but think about what's best for the actual citizens here. Another 30 seconds for Mr. Bozeman. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Arkansas is one of the most pro-life states in the country. Again, uh, as I go around the state, visit with constituents, most of them do not want their taxpayers' dollars used for abortion. And for that reason, I would be very much opposed, will be opposed, 
and will fight the effort uh, in Congress to allow taxpayer dollars to be used for military abortions. Next question from Ms. Munoz, and it goes first to Mr. James, or Ms. James. Ms. James. Yes, and uh, thank you all for being here today. Very much appreciate it. So there's no doubt that agriculture is a huge industry here in the state of Arkansas. Uh, wheat prices have gone up due to the conflict in Ukraine. Corn prices have gone up because of drought issues. Um, what do you believe is the federal government's role with regards to subsidizing farmers and those that make a living uh, farming? here in the state of Arkansas. And Ms. Kate, we go to you first. Ms. James. That's an excellent question. I do feel that our government should subsidize. Arkansas is one of those great states where we not only provide to just us, we provide to everyone across the nation and across the globe. Now, right now, we are in a global market, and we need to make sure that our farmers can remain competitive and can remain top of mind. We're number one in rice exports. We're number three or five in cotton and also in broiler cattle. So we want to make sure that our actual agriculture and our life and our way of life is sustainable and that our children can bring in agrotech and can bring in new things to continue to grow us forward and mix a 21st century education with our actual agriculture now to continue to grow us and make sure that we remain number one in everything. We go now to Mr. Bozeman. Well, thank you for the question. This is such an important question. Agriculture is 25% of our state's economy. But when you get outside of any town of any size, it's not 25%. It's probably 85 or 90%. This, in 2023, in the next Congress, every five years we do a big farm bill. Uh, I'm the head Republican on agriculture. I hope to be the chair of the Agriculture Committee in the next Congress. But what we'll be doing then is working very hard to make sure that the safety nets are put in place so that the farmers will be able to go to the bank, get the money that they need to make those loans so that they can come back and produce the safest, cheapest food supply of any place in our nation. So this is something that uh, we will be working on very hard together. Agriculture is not a partisan issue. It's not about Democrats and Republicans. It's about taking care of the farm community throughout rural America, which is so, so very important. Mr. Cates, you have one minute. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the question as well. Um, well, I don't agree with uh, federal subsidies um, necessarily. Um, if the state chooses to do that, you know, that's on them. Um, but one thing we could do um, is the federal government could deregulate the farming industry. Um, the EPA puts a lot of restrictions on them, um, and that could um, help them out, you know, um, grow more and do better and provide food for all of us. Thank you. Ms. James. We have regulations to better protect us. We have EPA regulations to protect our ground, our water, our air, and to make sure what's being put into our actual agriculture is helping everybody. I think the subsidies would be amazing as long as the subsidies were inclusive for everyone and all farmers and they're not competitive subsidies or competitive grants, what we're seeing across the nation. All farmers need to have ready access and available to these subsidies. So again, we can remain competitive in a global market. And back to Mr. Bozeman. Well, providing our farmers with the ability to have some stability, to make a business plan, to go to the bank, to borrow the money that they need uh, is so, so very important. Because of inflation, because of a, 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 the terrible energy policy that we have, much of, much of agriculture, the fertilizer that they depend on, many of the input costs, what it costs to, to run the, uh, the sprinklers, the tractors, et cetera, uh, the input costs are tremendous right now. And because of that, uh, uh, agriculture is in, in pretty dire straits. Well, Mr. Cates, a uh, half minute if you choose. No, sir. Uh, to Senator Bozeman first, rural Arkansas is becoming increasingly rural at uh, a really significant arresting pace. And the implications are really profound for the delivery of basic services, education, crime prevention, uh, environmental etc. What should be the federal government's role in addressing these problems that are going, to, they seem likely to mount for the Arkansas countryside? Steve, they are going to mount. And the reason being is that if you look at Arkansas, uh, I believe 52 of our 75 counties lost population. You start losing population, you lose those turn back dollars. You already don't have much to begin with and you just dig yourself in deeper. 
And that's why we mentioned agriculture. That's the thing that, that is so, so very important. Again, 85, 90% of, of the economy. But it's not just agriculture, it's rural schools, it's rural hospitals, protecting them. You lose your school, you lose your community. The same is true again of the rural hospitals. Uh, one of the things that we've worked on very, very hard, there's a lot of money in the system, again, in a very uh, bipartisan way, is providing broadband, uh, making, sure if you, making sure that they're able to access that. We used to think in terms of the three R's, roads, railroads, and runways. If you're not wired, you're not going to grow. Mr. Case. Yes, sir. They're leaving the state because there's no opportunity. Um, we need to lower taxes, get businesses to come back in the state, create jobs. That's what will get people here. Thank you. Ms. James. All right. We're going to elaborate on that lowering taxes. We need to make sure we're lowering taxes for the actual citizens so that way they can stay in state. In our rural areas, we are seeing a sharp decline in everybody leaving, but that's because the job opportunities aren't there and those jobs have been removed. Now, we want to make sure that in rural areas, they're not having to share hospitals. Last time I checked in some multiple counties, they have to share one hospital. That's not a conducive living environment or having to be portal meg or having to drive 100 miles to have a baby or having to drive 100 miles just in case you feel that something's wrong with your heart. They shouldn't have those those types of crises to deal with on top of being in the rural area. So federally, I feel that if we can address some of those issues and help with the environment, help with what's going on in the rural area, we would do a lot better in keeping our actual citizens there and well taken care of. Because right now, majority of the state is not taken care of, especially in the Delta. And it's unfortunate, and hopefully we'll have the opportunity to do more federally to better protect all citizens in Arkansas. Well, Mr. Bozeman, another 30. Well, we've got, a real, we've got some real challenges throughout the state, throughout rural Arkansas. The average age of our farmers is 60. 40% of the health care providers in Arkansas are over 60. Uh, young people are getting married at a much later age. Because of that, they're having fewer children. So again, the population is not there to backfill. And so as a result, we need to work uh, as a group the state, working with the federal government, working with our local governments, we need to make sure that uh, schools aren't disallowed because they've gone five students too low and you lose your rural school. 30 seconds for Mr. Kate. I know about sir. Oh, Ms. James. All right, so our schools are running low, and that's correct, and we should not be closing them, and we should not be allowing our states to raise the actual how many children to go from 300 to 750 minimum requirement for schools. Also, people aren't getting married because, well, let's get back to our platform, living wages. If you don't have living wages to sustain your household, what incentivizes you to get married? If you know that you're not going to have a job in your hometown, what incentivizes you to stay there? We have to do multiple incentives to keep people in the rural area and make sure they have a living adequate wage so that they can stay in that area and be better protected and feel safe. Another question now, excuse me, from Ms. Lee, and it goes first to uh, Ms. James. Ms. James, we had talked about spending before in a separate interview, and when asked about programs or departments that we could cut from, you had mentioned the Department of Defense's budget in a previous interview. So what is your current view on the, the military spending? Do we need to increase or cut back? Again, back to that, our military spending. Our military spending is extremely high, and we have a lot of things that we need to be taking care of. I do feel if we did cut some of the administrative roles and actually paid our E1 through E6 and made sure that the base of our actual soldiers are taken care of, because they are taken care of with the health care, we would have a better outcome. Reallocating those actual funds to our state or having a federal office work with our state office, our governor, so that we can use part of that $1.6 billion that was sent in. And that's from the actual citizens of Arkansas, and it's also from federal allocations. Now, we have where those federal allocations are sent in, and we have a center who doesn't ask where and why are they not being used for the actual citizens. And that needs to change, and I know I would make sure that I ask why are we not using those federal allocations to whatever or whoever the governor is to make sure that all Arkansans are better protected and have the resources and the accessibility that they need and they deserve. Uh, to Mr. Bozeman for one minute, sir. Well, we live in a very, very dangerous world. Uh, we have a, a war, a shooting war in Europe, which is really hard to imagine. My dad was a waste gunner on B-17s. Hard for me to imagine. My children, my grandchildren, uh, you know, again, how can this be? But it has occurred. 
Uh, the United States is intervening and helping, providing materials. It's just an example of the different hotspots throughout the world. We have Iran. Uh, we have uh, China flexing their muscles, looking at Taiwan. Uh, we're helping Israel, uh, protecting them in the Middle East. So there's so many things going on. The last thing that we need to do is cut defense. If anything, I would be an advocate, uh, certainly with inflation, uh, we need to make sure that we uh, have the defense that we need uh, for sure. Uh, to Mr. Cates. Yes, sir. The first thing I would cut in defense spending is money that goes to woke agendas. Our soldiers need to do one thing and one thing only, and that's defend America and win battles. That's how they defend America. Um, another thing would be right now defense contractors, lobbyists, they're setting the stage for when we go to war and not, or when we go to war or not not the legislative branch, and that needs to change. Thank you. Ms. James. When we talk about war, we're talking about making sure our job in the United States is, and our job in the Senate is to balance those alliances and manage those and de-escalate those crises. So what we're seeing in Ukraine, it's where we're doing de-escalation because God forbid, we don't want a World War III. And in order to do that, we have to make sure we have provisions available. So that does mean reallocating from our actual military to send over to aid to those who need it so that they can have the provisions so we don't have to use our military in order to prevent, well, provide um, services to a foreign, um, a foreign country. I want to make sure that we understand it's important that we have federal, federal candidates that are going to manage and de-escalate and appropriately use the funds appropriately for have, all our Kansans. Have to call time. Yes. Uh, Mr. Bozeman, another 30 seconds. Well, we spend a lot of money. We waste a lot of money on things that the federal government has no business doing. The defense of our nation, though, I can't do that as an individual. The state of Arkansas, Senator Hutchison, our legislature can't do that. We depend on the federal government. So this is one of those things where it's, it's not a question of how much, it's, it's a question of what's needed. And then we need to provide the funding, uh, whatever it takes, to keep our soldiers safe and to keep us safe. Mr. Case. Uh, yes, sir. Um if we look back at the war in Afghanistan, the U.S. government admits that $69 billion was wasted of the $2.3 trillion. So I want to ask everybody, this, these billions that we're sending to Ukraine, how much of that is getting wasted? I want freedom for the, the people of Ukraine. I pray for their peace. Um, but we have to look at how much of that is not going to what it's, it says that the people are saying it's going to. Again, $69 billion in Afghanistan lost of the 2.3 trillion. To Ms. Munoz, and a question first for Mr. Bozeman. Yes, and this is actually a question that came from one of our viewers. Uh, President Biden has pardoned Americans who served federal time for a simple marijuana possession. Do you agree? And of course, why or why not? And Senator Bozeman, we go first to you. No, thank you for the question. And uh, President Biden has pardoned those that are in federal penitentiary for simple possession. I think when we look at that, that really would just be a handful of people. Uh, we did a massive reform several years ago of, of, of reforming the system so that people uh, like that would stay out of jail. What happens is that uh, you commit serious offenses and then your plea bargain down to simple possession. For those that are in a federal penitentiary for smoking a marijuana cigarette, uh, you know, they need to be let out. Their, their, their records expunged expunged. On the other hand, if you're in jail for possession of marijuana and you committed a serious crime, then uh, you need to stay in there. Mr. Cates. Uh, yes, sir. I agree that any um, person incarcerated, over half of the people incarcerated in the U.S., it's for a simple drug possession. Uh, they need to be released if they haven't committed a violent crime or a crime with a victim. Um, the war on drugs is a, it's a failure. It's over 100 years old. Um, if we have to look at policy and figure out if it's effective or not, and the results is how we do that, okay? And if we look at the war on drugs, the results, it's only gotten worse. And marijuana, it's, it's not even considered an unhealthy drug. We need to look at the, you know, 90% of drug use is what the UN Drug Office calls non-problematic. You don't get addicted. Um, you don't have any health issues, 90%.
and marijuana is not even on that, all right? It's the, and it's 10%, and those are opiate overdoses. And, and even opiates need to be not criminalized, but treated as a medical condition. Um, and we can do this without compromising the safety of the American people. To Ms. James. I agree with what the administration is doing. It's important and a step in the right direction to decriminalize on a state level and also on a federal level to continue to help out and add to our economy and add citizens back to our working class and our workforce so that we can have a more productive, robust America, a robust Arkansas, and just so that we can, again, compete on a global market. Right now, we're trying to keep up with everybody else, and it's important that we have all Americans available to do that. And if they want to go in and serve into the military, they have the opportunity to do that and not let an indiscretion such as a simple charge that's being released hinder them from serving their country or getting a job or providing back. And that helps alleviate crime, helps alleviate poverty, and it helps bring in two household incomes so there are more people to be able to get married. So it's important and I'm glad to see that we're having the step in the right direction and I hope the state continues to follow. We go back to Mr. Bozeman for another 30 seconds. Well, I agree. If you're in a federal penitentiary and only 2% of the criminals that are incarcerated in, are in federal penitentiaries. Uh, so if you're there and you've smoked a marijuana joint and you got picked up, they need to let you out. I don't think there's very many of those. I think that this is part of the president sitting around in the Oval Office and trying to deflect from the economy, from inflation, and from the border. If you want to do something about drugs, we need to control the border. Uh, 70,000 Americans died of overdose, of fentanyl overdose, this last year. Uh, to Mr. Case, 30 seconds, sir. Uh, not only control the border, but m most of the stuff that's used to make fentanyl is coming from China. We need to address that as well. Ms. James, 30 seconds to do this. I agree. We do need to address protecting our actual ports and those borders because that's where majority of actual drugs that are being brought in. We do need to talk about inflation and we do need to talk about all the other wonderful things, but this is an important step to actually help people right now in real time that's so needed in these times. We're still in a global pandemic. We've lost a lot of lives, a lot of family, and we have the opportunity to actually heal some families and bring people back together, which is rightly so, and what we should be focusing on and what our bipartisan efforts should be doing. Education outcomes in the United States have for decades, I suppose, uh, as measured against other countries, have achievement levels against other students in other countries have been disappointing. Post-pandemic, they have been especially disappointing. Uh, Mr. Cates, first, what role, first, what role do you see the federal government playing, if any, and what should be the extent now of federal assistance to states in terms of education, K-12. I think we need to decentralize education and get the federal government out of it, sir. Um, currently, the U.S. students in reading, math, and English rank 20th, 30th, and 40th in the world. All right, we should be in the top three. That's, you know, this is the greatest country in the world. Um, and the government keeps getting in the way of that. They, they tell teacher, they tell the states, the teachers, the parents, how to teach, what to teach, and they, they just need to get out of the way. Ms. James. I feel that the federal government is needed to better make sh better maintain our school systems, especially locally where we might not have all the full provisions that are needed and resources. We saw in Little Rock School District where the state took over and we had nine failing schools. Now, once the state gave it back, we had 22 failing schools. So saying that we don't need the federal to come in and better help with the state, I don't agree with that. My mother was an educator. I'm a daughter of a minister and a small business owner. And my mother told me something very important. When somebody shows you who they are the first time, you need to believe them. And right now we're hearing some very polished answers from a career politician, my opponent, John Bozeman. And right now I'm not up here to give you pretty words or sell you pretty words. I'm here to make sure you know you have an option and you have a choice on who's gonna better represent you, your education, your future, and your family. And when we talk about not having the federal provisions needed for our education and our future, how are we going to advance ourselves with agriculture? How are we going to advance ourselves with military? How are we going to advance ourselves with anything if we don't have a proper education system for our most vulnerable? I go now to, uh, we go now to Mr. Bozeman. For Thank you, Steve. Uh, education is, is right at the very top. I was on the school board for seven years and very proud, proud to serve in that capacity. 
there is all kinds of room for the federal government helping out, and they are helping out. Education is primarily a state function, but again, lots of help from the federal government. One of the things I'm very excited about is their help with the vocational programs. Uh, shop class is not like it was when I was in school. Now, teaming with our, with our vocational uh, colleges, uh, you can go to school, you can, at the end of the 11th grade, you can be a phlebotomist and have the certificate. By the time that you graduate from high school, you can be an LPN. By the time the first year after that, you can be a registered nurse and again, make a very, very good wage. This is the key. In order for Arkansas to move forward, we've got to have the workforce that we need. We've got to have a skilled workforce. Those are the jobs that we want, and this is the way to do it. To Mr. Case for 30 seconds. Yes, sir. And I do agree that vocation is a great thing. That's something the states can do. The states have enough money. And again, if we want to look at the effectiveness of a policy, we have to look at the results. The federal government's been involved in education for a long time, and the results speak for themselves, right? Again, 20th, 30th, 40th place in math, reading, and science compared to the rest of the world. So there's, the federal government's been involved, and, and we see the results. Thank you. Ms. James. Policy from the federal government is supposed to be preventative and impactful for all citizens and all constituents. It shouldn't be reactive. And what we're seeing on a state level is a very reactive policy against our actual education system. We need to make sure that we have the federal protections in place so that we do have the correct policies that are gonna go us further. Again, I, I can't keep saying it, but I am gonna keep saying it. A 21st century education to compete in the global market is so important and critical for Arkansas, ranked 43 in education. And to Mr. Bozeman. Thank you, Steve. I, I'm a real proponent of regional, the regional concept. And again, the federal government has helped with that. Uh, you can't do these things by yourself. What you're seeing is schools going together, counties going together, and it really is make a difference. I agree, we need to have metrics, we need to have outcome, we need to hold people responsible. That's why I like it so much that these programs, you're not just going to class and studying, you're actually working towards a certificate so that once you uh, get through with school, uh, you can make a living wage. Ms. Lee now, first to Mr. Bozeman. Yeah, Senator Bozeman, we are seeing rapid growth, especially in Northwest Arkansas, um, where our station is. Companies like Walmart building a new headquarters, Tyson requiring all headquarter employees now to move to Arkansas to work out of their Springdale office. J.B. Hunt, one of the latest to reconsider growth in our area. What is the federal government's role in our infrastructure plan? How do we deal with the growth? Well, infrastructure is so, so very important. And that's one of those issues that's not a, generally a partisan issue. I'm on the Environment and Public Works Committee. I had the opportunity to serve on the, on the uh, Transportation Committee in the House. That's the, the road building. I've been involved, I think, with everyone except for this last one, uh, the, uh, when you conference in committee. So I'm, I'm committed to that. That's how you move forward. Uh, we used to think in terms of roads, railroads, runways, water, that's how you, an area developed. But now you, you certainly have to have broadband. Uh, so the other thing that we have to do, and I mentioned, I mentioned the importance of working together. That's one thing that the, that the regional aspect of Northwest Arkansas does a very good job through the Northwest Council. Uh, so it's not only Northwest Arkansas, it's Central Arkansas, the Jonesboro region, we have some hot spots uh, that are very important to take care of. Mr. Cates, you have one minute. Yes, sir. In regards to the federal government and providing uh, money for infrastructure, they just passed an infrastructure bill and hardly any of it's going to infrastructure. Um, also, if we want the government to take care of our infrastructure, let's look at how they take care of the, theirs. They have 77,000 buildings that are not used or underused that cost $1.7 billion of taxpayer money each year. So do we really want them taking care of our infrastructure? Ms. James, one minute. I'm so glad to see reallocation, I'm glad to see people relocate and Tyson mandating people to relocate. And I'm glad that we do have the infrastructure bill that was put in place, no thanks to our current Senator. And I'm grateful to see it. 
What we're also seeing is we have a senator who voted against the infrastructure bill, but is quick to show up when it's time for a ribbon cutting for a marina, but not for the actual roads and railways. And when I heard him speak, I didn't hear him say anything about the Delta or South Arkansas. And that's an important part of the state. That's over 450,000 citizens that are quite frankly, fly over country, I guess, to our senator. So we need to make sure that we have somebody that's going to utilize all of the infrastructure and use it in a bipartisan way to continue to grow Arkansas the way that Arkansas deserves to grow. And quite frankly, in the last 20 years, we have not had that opportunity. We've been last in everything that I've seen for the last 20 years since I was in high school. And it's time for us to change, and it's time for us to grow together and be inclusive of the whole state in all regions, including the South. Uh, Mr. Bozeman, another 30 seconds. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, again, I've been very, very involved in infrastructure and feel like it's so, so very important. It's interesting, I didn't vote for the last infrastructure bill. The reason I didn't vote for it is I'm on the Environment and Public Works, the committee that put together the roads and railroads and runways and that aspect of it. We allocated more money than ever been spent before came out of committee 19 to nothing. Uh, the Democrats then stuck $300 billion of wasteful spending on it that had nothing to do with infrastructure. That's why I voted no. We go back to Mr. Cates. Yes, sir. Again, if we want to look at how the government handles infrastructure, look at how they handle their own. They just passed an infrastructure bill, and the majority of it doesn't go to infrastructure at all. $370 billion to climate change. Um, 25 million to you know non-bias or implicit bias you know a training. So again, if we want to look at how they handle it, how they handle infrastructure, look at how they handle their own. To Ms. James, voting against something and not providing any type of solution is not is not is not what Arkansas needs and deserves. I'm going to repeat again: two decades, three bills passed, a post office for Harrison, Arkansas but you vote against infrastructure and do not provide any solutions to better help all of Arkansas. You mentioned Northwest Arkansas, Jonesboro, and Central Arkansas. But again, forget and negate the South. When they need that critical infrastructure, you voted against it. So we need to make sure we have somebody that's gonna vote again for all of Arkansas. Christina Munoz, question. Yes, let's talk about the healthcare industry. So many hospitals in Arkansas, especially rural Arkansas, only survived the pandemic because of federal assistance. They are now again struggling. Do we need more federal assistance or is it a game of if they fail, they fail? But especially in rural Arkansas, that's a huge concern. Mr. Cates, to you first. Yes, ma'am, thank you for the question. Uh, both parties always argue how to fund healthcare, the healthcare system, instead of how to fix it. The problem with the healthcare system is the billing. All the prices are hidden, which there's no free market competition. You, if you have a heart attack, you know, say in South Arkansas, South Arkansas, it could cost 25,000. If you have a heart attack in North Arkansas, it could cost 400,000. The, the, they keep the prices hidden. They charge outrageous markups. Uh, one study, it showed that 23% or 23 times, excuse me, marked up the original or Medicare allowable price. We need to make billing, op healthcare billing open and inspire that free market competition. Thank you. Ms. James. You are correct, we do. And we have something and we had a provision, a bipartisan act that actually put in place to better help alleviate all of those questions. And it was the Affordable, Affordable Cares Act. Well, it was broken apart in a way that shouldn't have been broken apart and didn't help all of Arkansas and all Americans. Now you are correct, we do see a lot of hospital deserts all across the state and it's important that we have the actual hospitals being taken care of and federally, it is a lot more that we could be doing to keep a lot of them open so that people aren't again having to drive hundreds of miles, people aren't having to be flown in and people aren't having to decide, do I want to take my medicine now and divvy it up so until I get to my doctor's appointment and deciding do I want to have this drive, spend another gas tank full of gas to drive to Little Rock when I live again in South Arkansas and I don't, I mean Arkansas, and I don't have the resources available to us, especially with our veterans. We need to make sure that everything is totally taken care of with all hospitals across the state, and that should be first and foremost. And to Mr. Bozeman for one minute. Thank you. Uh, again, rural hospitals are so important. Uh, if you don't have a rural hospital, you lose it. 
you lose it in your county, you lose it in your community, you lose your doctors, pretty soon you lose your community. That's the first thing that people look at as they decide where to settle is, what are, what are the amenities in play? What are the schools like? That's why schools are so important. Again, what's the healthcare situation look like? There's a number of federal programs that are helping rural hospitals. Hospitals, uh, even though we had the pandemic, uh, many of them, were de they weren't able to do elective surgeries and things like that. That's kind of their bread and butter. It's amazing they were really slammed during the pandemic, although lots of people were sick. So I'm committed to continuing those programs uh, as we go forward, recognizing the importance of the rural hospital system. We return to Mr. Cates for 30 seconds. Yes, sir. Uh, the Affordable Care Act was mentioned. The Affordable Care Act was written by the same companies that want to keep the prices hidden. Thank you. Ms. James. <laughs> we're here and where we're talking about hospitals and making sure that everybody has a doctor, but we're also hearing where we have a federal abortion ban that's being put in place, a national abortion ban that our party, another party doesn't want for the rest of everybody. We need to make sure that we are protecting our hospitals the same way we are protecting our doctors and make sure our doctors can make adequate decisions, decisions to protect all citizens within those said hospitals. Because we can open up plenty of them, but if we're not allowing our doctors to actually take care of our patients in the full capacity for full health care, then we're doing them a disservice. Got to go to Mr. Bozeman now for 30 yeah, seconds. The, uh, again, helping hospitals with new designs, partnering with bigger hospitals and bigger communities. Uh, those are things. Telemedicine has been a big uh, boom uh, for uh, rural medicine. So these are things that we can work on, again, realizing the importance as we go forward, uh, protecting our rural communities. We are going to pause for just a moment to uh, let you know, or remind you actually, that uh, the candidates are free to participate in a press conference individually directly following the debate. To watch that live from your home or wherever you scan your QR code on your screen, there it is from, uh, with your mobile device, and you will see that QR code periodically through the balance of our debate. Uh, fresh question now, uh, and it goes first to Ms. James. Hardly any other issue, certainly in Arkansas, is driving the political debate this season than crime. What do you see as the federal government's role vis-a-vis -vis cities and states in addressing the problem? Addressing the problem first means actually thinking about a solution for it. We haven't heard solutions from the other side as to how we can help alleviate crime. Well, the solution is simple. Make sure we pay people a federal, excuse me, a fair and adequate wage. Make sure that they have the health care there available for them. Make sure that they have the provi provided and needed resources for education. Because when you aren't making enough money, you make stress decisions, and sometimes you make poor decisions. We have nine private prisons in Arkansas and that's too many. We don't have a recidivism program that incorporates getting people back on and back into the actual socialization and population of Arkansas. And that's another aspect that we should be focusing on because a lot of this crime is from repeat offenders because we're not training and coaching and motivating them to be citizens. We are motivating them to continue to be career, career criminals and we shouldn't be doing that. Senator Bozeman, one minute. Well, thank you. This, this again, is, is a question that we've got to deal with. Uh, Arkansas, the nation has experienced significant crime. You pick up a newspaper and uh, you read that in Little Rock, we're one of the top 20, top 30, usually top 20 most violent crimes, uh, most violent crimes per capita. Well, that's not just Little Rock, that's Arkansas when people see that when they're trying to decide where they want to settle. Uh, so there's a big place for the federal government to be helpful. I'm on the subcommittee that controls funding for uh, various programs uh, like this. The Burn JAG program, which is a program that gives policemen, and gives law enforcement the tools that they need to keep themselves safe, to keep us safe. Uh, these are the kind of programs that we need to support uh, as we go forward. Mr. Cates? 
Uh, yes, sir. We fight crime by not demonizing the guys who fight it. Um, currently, most uh, police officers or police departments, excuse me, they're experiencing significant turnover. A friend of mine is in law enforcement and he's down three guys just on his shift alone because we've demonized the guys who fight it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, James. Right now, holding somebody accountable is not demonizing them. Holding people accountable for their actions, just as I hope that all of Arkansas will hold me accountable when I am your future senator, is something that's needed on all fronts, regardless of who it is that you are. Now, we do need to address the mental health crisis and make sure that we have the mental health workers and make sure that we're addressing the major issues that are contributing factors to crime and to poverty. And if we can address those issues in a more sound way, we can alleviate a lot of that actual stress that law enforcement is receiving. Mr. Bozeman, you have another 30 seconds. I, I've had the opportunity to visit with all of the federal law enforcement agencies in the state, asking them what they need to do a better job helping local law enforcement. Uh, there's a lot of task force that go on, uh, and again, uh, making sure that they've got what they need. The other thing that we did, myself and, and Senator Cotton, uh, under the Trump administration, we put two prosecutors in place uh, that did a very, very good job fighting crime and again, helping the local police. Mr. Cakes. Yes, sir. I agree holding individual officers accountable or, and to an, a high standard. We give them a lot of authority and responsibility, but we shouldn't, demon, we shouldn't demonize a whole, the whole industry and all of them. All right. We should just hold the one accountable and support the rest. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lee has a question first for Mr. Cates. All right, Mr. Cates, let's talk about immigration. Many people across the political spectrum say that our immigration system is broken and in crisis. How do you think the current administration is handling immigration? If you had a moment with the president, how would you uh, counsel the president to reform our immigration system? Thank you for the question, Ms. Lee. Uh, well, they're not handling it, obviously. Thousands of illegal aliens come across the border every day. And I, I want those people, you know, to have a better life, you know, just like I'm sure we all are. But we're a nation of borders. We're a sovereign nation. You know, that's what makes it is our borders. And we, we need to secure it and we need to focus on immigration reform, such as work visas, um, so these people can come in and make a better life for their family. Thank you. Ms. James. We're a nation of immigrants and we can't forget that. We did not originate here in America. We came over seeking shelter from religious persecution and from taxes. So we can't sit here and call them illegal immigrants. We need to call them what they are. They are refugees seeking asylum, seeking help, because that's the same thing that we did when we first came over here. And the same rights should be allotted to anybody else that wants to come over here and be a citizen and be a productive citizen. Now I do agree, we do need to cut a lot of the red tape. There's too much red tape that's hindering the actual asylum process, the refugee process, or any of the immigration process. Right now, we need to make sure we're doing what's best and what's humane for everyone involved in all parties, even if it means hiring more people to make sure that they're able to adequately process and get everybody in and bring people to a safe way of life. Over to Mr. Bozeman. We need to secure the border. Uh, and you, if you don't secure the border, it doesn't matter what immigration system you put in, then it won't work because people will continue to flood across. And it is a flood. Uh, it's a humanitarian crisis. It's a national security crisis. Eighty people in this last year were apprehended on the border that were on the uh, terrorist watch list. Three and a half million people were caught since Biden has taken control. 500,000 they know cross the border, but they weren't able to be apprehended. You think about it, we're a state that has three, little over three million people. You've got the state of Arkansas coming in in the last two years, and everybody feels like it'll be even greater unless we do something, plus a million people. What do you do with these folks? Where do you do them? Some have been sent to, to New York, a few thousand, the sanctuary city. They've gone crazy, tried to trawl out the National Guard, won a billion dollars. This is a national crisis and a national Time, security sir. Time, issue. Time, sir. Mr. Cates, 30 seconds. Yes, sir. We are a nation of immigrants, but those immigrants came in legally. They had to register on Ellis Island. Mm -hmm. And my immediate family is immigrants uh, or, or immigrated to the U.S. And we did it the right way, the legal way. Thank you. 
Ms. James? Right now, what we're seeing, we do have, when we talk about immigration again, and we talk about securing our border, three million people were stopped. That sounds really secure to me. Drugs were stopped. That sounds like what we have in place is working. Now stopping actual individuals, whether it's three million people coming over here to seek asylum, guess what, America is large. Most of America could fit in in Alaska, the size of Alaska, and still have an acre of their own. So we have plenty of space to put them here. We have want to be productive citizens, allow them the opportunity to do that. And if they don't, then that's what the immigration process is for, to continue to have those that are here that are going to be productive. Got a th uh, Mr. Bozeman, 30 seconds. Well, we are a nation of immigrants. We've got five million people in line doing it the right way. Most of them, it will take up to 10 years to get their, their, their naturalization. We naturalize a million people a year, more almost than the rest of the world put together. We can be very proud of that. We're a nation of laws. We can't have hundreds of thousands, literally uh, you know, millions of people crossing the border uh, in an unlawful way. Ms. Munoz, question first for Ms. James. Yes, talking about higher education, uh, the cost of college, the rising cost of college is making it almost unattainable for many Arkansans. So whether or not you agree with the student loan debt relief plan that is still being argued over, what would you do to help struggling Arkansans pay for higher education? Ms. James first. Well, I'm a mom of a 17 year old getting ready to face that. So making sure she has the education she needs, any supplemental education so that she can have scholarships and explaining that you don't have to leave home, you can still go here and there are different types of vocational trades and other options available. We push college, but college might not be for everybody. We need to make sure that we're pushing all options that are for our children because not every kid is the same. And we wanna make sure that we're recognizing that. Now with the student loan forgiveness, I think it's a step in the right direction because it helps those in South Arkansas. It helps those all in Arkansas, especially those communities of color. It helps those communities that are often left behind by career politicians with wonderful shiny answers, but not real solutions. So I'm glad to see that we have an actual solution put in place and not another trope, our fear mongering trope when we talk about inflation or borders or anything else. It's time to stop with the fear and it's time for us to actually advocate for our future and advocate for all constituents. Mr. Bozeman. Well, I'm opposed to the Biden plan of uh, forgiveness. Uh, the reason being it's not fair. Why is it fair if you just paid off your student loans before March of 2020? Uh, and then if you just took a student loan out after that, you get your loan forgiven on one end and the other not. Why is it fair that a family of 250,000, making $250,000 gets loan forgiveness of $20,000 when you've got a hardworking family making 35, 50, 70,000, whatever, nobody's paying off their debts. So for that reason, I'm very much opposed. What we've got to do is get the university system under control in the sense that their inflation rate has been tremendously greater than the normal inflation rate. Mr. Cates. Uh, yes, sir. I agree that vocational should be another option and that the prices of uh, college is is out of control, like healthcare as well. Uh, but remember, it, student loan forgiveness, the federal government paying for someone's student loan is not free. Somebody has to pay for it, the taxpayer does. So you're just transferring debt from one person to another. Ms. James? We're gonna talk about forgiving loans. We need to talk about PPP loans that were forgiven to numerous colleagues and coworkers of our divested Senator John Bozeman from his company. We have seen 10 articles talked about having easeability and feasibility for these corporations, but we have not and have yet to see about easeability and 10 articles for actual student loans, our relief for citizens of Arkansas, are those citizens and students wanting to go to school? And I think that's something important and indicative of a future senator to have to make sure that they're thinking about everybody not just the corporate colleagues and co-workers and making sure their PPP loans and the amounts of millions of dollars are forgiven versus 10,000. To, to Mr. Bozeman. Well again we need to uh, Pell Grant scholarships and certainly there's a place for that in the federal government. You need to get your act straight in the sense of uh, when you accuse people of things. Uh, I have not received any PPP loans. I don't know where that's coming from. My brother and I started a clinic 
uh, many, many years ago. I worked there 24 years. I've not been associated with it for two decades. So, like you say, I don't know who is feeding your facts, but they're totally false. And uh, right's right and wrong's wrong. I said divested. You are divested, correct? I haven't worked there in, in 20 years. That is right. You're divested from it. I said your colleagues the save it, your corporation. Save it for closing <laughs> statements if we can. If we I can, because I have to be. I have to be fair to Mr. Senator. I have to be fair to Mr. Case. Throughout the years. I mentioned your articles, not you. So. And I said you're divested. Correct. Mr. K Mr. Cates is up. And no rebuttal, sir. Thank you. The, or, okay. Can I have his time? <laughs> Closing statements. Now, time for closing statements. And as determined prior to the broadcast, uh, Mr. Cates, you're first. You have one minute, sir. Yes, sir. If you feel like there's something wrong in D.C., it's because there is. Congress has a current approval rating that's almost in the single digits. Both parties answer to big corporations and the woke mob. We need leaders who put people first, not profit or politics. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bozeman, you have one minute. Well, thank you. We've got the uh, senior broadcaster in, in uh, Arkansas, the guy that is kind of the, the dean of broadcasting. We've got Ms. Lee, Ms. Munoz, the, the future uh, deans of broadcasting here. So we appreciate your hard work and appreciate public broadcasting. Uh, as I go around the state, the, 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 the primary thing I hear about, in fact, I've always said if you if you can't make a living, if you can't take care of your family, everything else is pretty important, unimportant. The thing that's killing Americans right now is inflation. 8.2 percent, we've had eight, over 8.2 percent inflation for the last seven months. Remember, this was going to be transitory. So we're in a situation now where we simply have to do something about that. And so I believe that if we lift our eyes above and get to work here, working together, uh, we'll be able to solve that problem. We've got a lot of other problems that we can solve working together, and America Senator, will continue to be the greatest, freest country. Got to call time, Senator. Anywhere. I apologize. Thank you. Ms. James, you have one minute. Call inflation what it is. Inflation is corporate grade. And as I said before, we've seen numerous corporations and colleagues of our and current incumbent received millions of dollars worth of PPP loans to be forgiven, and yet they continue to have 50-year profits, higher than we've ever seen. And yes, we do have 8.8% inflation right now, but it's forecasted to go down because of what the current administration is doing. It's forecasted to go down to 5.3%. Enough with the tropes, enough with the fear, enough with the wolf in sheep's clothing, enough with the political 20-year polished very polished, rehearsed responses. They tell you exactly what they want you to hear, and then they go back to Washington and vote against your best interests. Arkansas, you have a choice. You have a choice right now to make sure you have somebody that's gonna vote for veterans, our families, our working class, and make sure that everybody is taken care of. And I'm Natalie James, and I'm asking you for your vote today, and for you to check out my issues and our platform at jamesforarkansas.com. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And with that, we thank our three candidates for appearing on our broadcast. And to our viewers, you can watch this and all the Arkansas PBS debates on demand at the Arkansas PBS YouTube channel, on the PBS video app, and on our website. A reminder, the candidates have the option to participate in a press conference directly following this debate, which will air on YouTube. You can watch it live. It's on YouTube, part of our live stream. Once again, scan the QR code on your screen now and begin watching on YouTube. Once again, our thanks to our three nominees and to our panelists and to the audience here in the Reynolds Center on the campus of UCA and, of course, to you at home. Election Day, Tuesday, November 8th.
Major funding for Election 2022 Arkansas PBS Debates is provided by AARP Arkansas with additional funding provided by the Arkansas State Chamber of Commerce. Oh, that's a long walk. How are y'all doing? Good. So I'm Natalie James, running for United States Senate, and I am the first black Democratic nominee for United States Senate ever. We're a former Confederate state, and we have an opportunity here to do something great, Arkansas. So I'm so appreciative for you today and the questions and anything that you might want to ask today. Clarify um, the the comment that you made toward the end about PPP loans. Were you trying to claim that uh, 
the se the senator had received PPP loans, or what? Mm -hmm. I guess what, what what was the implication you were trying to make? Well, when we're talking about student loan forgiveness, I wanted him to understand that he's written over ten articles about having easeability for PPP loans for his colleagues and coworkers. Not him, because I understand he is divested from any corporation. But he does have colleagues who have taken them out. He does have other corporations and friends that have taken those out. So I wanted to make sure that I asked him the correct question and expressed that if you think it's okay for corporations and your friends and benefactors to have PPP loans, why is it not okay for normal, hardworking Arkansans to do the same? Those PPP loans in the millions are forgiven. And we're talking about student loans to the amount of ten to 20000 that will help the people in the South that he forgets about and hasn't talked about and continued even today. Didn't mention the South or the Delta. And we have voters there. Whenever you talked to him after, were you able to sort of clarify some of that if he didn't understand it? At the time? Yeah, he just wasn't listening, but I think it's just time to have somebody that's going to have an open ear, both open ears, and make sure we have some type of generational change because it seems like he already had his mind made up. And I wanted to make sure that I clarified with him that I know he hasn't. He called our um, DPA chair to let him know that instead of calling me directly. And I corrected myself in an interview that I had with Black Consumer Radio. And I explained to him, I understand you're divested, but you have written over four, well, he's written over 10 articles talking about forgiveness for his colleagues, for forgiveness for corporations that donate to him and make sure that he's able to run, but not thoroughly represent all citizens and not represent the actual citizens that vote for him. You mentioned something in the debate about, uh, I, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not sure I understood it clearly, you said something about how he had passed three bills and about a post office and yeah. Harrison. Uh, I was just curious what you were talking about when you said that. So in 20 years, two decades, and of course he said seven years on the LRSD, well not LRSD, but on the school board, he's done 27 years of public service. And in 27 years of public service, he's only passed three bills into legislation. One of those bills, the largest of that bill, was passing a post office in Harrison, Arkansas, and naming it after Congressman Hammerstein. So that is not what Arkansas needs. That is not what I want. That's the, not the type of experience that we deserve. Arkansas has the opportunity to have the voting record they deserve and to have the experience and have a voice in that experience. And unfortunately, like we heard today, our voices aren't being heard clearly. So we want to make sure that we have somebody who's going to listen to every word that we say. Given the state's makeup and poll, the polling, it, you know, it's a double-digit race, what gives you any realistic hope uh, of being able to close that, that big of a gap in a state like Arkansas? Well, polls are really subjective. And after 2016 watching that poll, I don't have too much faith in them, especially when I looked at the actual number. See, people just look at the top number, but don't go look and where, see where those actual people were polled from. When you have 42% Republicans polled and 26% Democrats polled and maybe 13% of independents polled, it leaves out a vast, vast, large margin. Now, it would be different if that poll had an actual equal number of people polled from equal parties to give you the actual better assertion, but you're getting a poll from from just one conglomerate small area of the state and not the actual whole state. So I have great faith in our state. I know how many people I've registered to vote. I know how many people I've talked to. I know how many people know that I'm not going to leave them behind or forget or half hear anything that's being said to me. So I'm feeling that this election is going to be extremely, extremely different, and it's going to be probably an upset, if not a runoff. So I'm very hopeful. I have faith in Arkansas, and I have faith in the voters that are tired, especially the 51 percent who don't like being told what to do. So we want to make sure that we look at those numbers and think about what's happened. Polls are very subjective, and in 2016, we saw this subjectiveness. Polling that shows a different. Uh, no, I result. don't have any internal polling. Okay. But you, so you think the polling should poll an equal number of Republicans and Democrats, that, even though I think it should poll a larger number and not just in one small area. If you're going to poll, poll from all over the whole state, not just in parts like I was saying with um, our current senator, where he talks about Northwest Arkansas, Jonesboro, and Central Arkansas. There are other parts to the state, so it should be inclusive of everybody, just like our actual legislative assembly. It should be very inclusive of everybody to be reflective. 
Any more questions? I have a question from YouTube. Okay. From Laura W. All right. How will you protect Social Security, not just for seniors, but for people on disability too? Yeah, people on disability and children who've lost a parent. So I want to make sure that Social Security is well protected. That is a right. You've paid into it. We shouldn't be touching it. We should make sure that we have a Senate majority so that we can better protect it. That's how we're going to be able to protect it and make sure we have the right people who have the same mindset that aren't going to put people in harm's way, especially unduly. And right now, if we let the agenda go through, unfortunately, we are going to have people put in harm's way, not just women, not just people with uteruses, but also our elderly. And we see how well they think what happened with the COVID, with COVID-19, um, those responses. They weren't very nice to our elderly and those on Social Security. Their attitude was let them eat cake and enough of wolf and sheep's clothing. We have to have better and we deserve better. Any more? All right, well, I appreciate y'all and thank you so much. Y'all have a great one. Is all psyched up. No, first of all, I'd like to thank, uh, I want to say AETN, but Arkansas P PBS. These things don't happen. I was talking to the camera crew and, and just patting them on the back. This, this is a big deal, uh, especially doing it. It's one thing to, to televise the debate. But with, I think they had nine cameras out there. You know, this, this, they really did a very, very good job. And uh, because of that, this has really become the debate forum of the, uh, you know, of the year when we're in an when a election cycle. So again, just a big thanks to them for all they've done. I'll answer any easy questions you got. Can, can you, following up on the comments on PPP, what, uh, you, you didn't really get you didn't really get a chance to respond. What did you make of her comments, and what was the, the and just to clarify, did, did, have you received any PPP loans? No, I, I have not received any PPP loans. I don't have any businesses that I could get a PPP loan out of. I, I don't think I would have if, again, because of my. But but no, I haven't. What bothered me in, in past comments and what she was trying to say there was that somehow I had received PPP loans because uh, I think because of the clinic that my brother and I started many, many decades alone, uh, alone ago, I've not uh, been associated with for over 20 years. And so the idea that somehow because I worked there and started it and they got a PPP loan, that somehow that was connected to me is idiotic. It's a matter of integrity. You don't go around doing those things if you want to represent the people of Arkansas. That's a basic. So um, I asked her, I said, you know, I've worked at a lot of places. You know, I was on work study when I was at, at uh, Southern College of Optometry. I've had various jobs throughout my life. Are all of those people not able to get a PPP loan because I was there? I mean, it's just, it makes no sense at all. But what it is, it's a half-truth Half truths are whole lies, uh, and those kind of things bother me. Okay, I, I've got a record. You know, you can beat me up about a lot of stuff, but you know, again, just making up stuff again is a matter of integrity. Even if Republicans win the, win the majority, win the majority, it's still 
it would most likely still be below that six that sixty vote threshold. Are you going to be able to even in, if you're in the majority? Are you be, going to be able to get much done, or is this basically going to be just a different version of what we've seen before in the Senate? No, not not at all. And there really has been a lot done. Uh, one of the other things that she she said that I hadn't done is essentially not done anything. And so I was writing down in the in the last uh, several weeks, we passed the PACT Act. Uh, I was a guy that had a great deal to, to, to do with that. We actually had a, a standalone bill that we included. If you watch our commercials, Bill Rhodes, uh, he came to us. Uh, part of that, we did a bill that, that recognized Vietnam veterans that were part of uh, being exposed to toxic agents uh, back during uh, uh, Vietnam. We were able to include that in the bill. Uh, we also had a huge part in getting that bill passed. That's the biggest, that's the biggest veterans bill in the last 30 years. Uh, the MAMO Act, this has to do with making sure that women uh, that uh, have been exposed to, to toxic uh, chemicals around burn pits, what they're doing is they're developing breast cancer at a much, much earlier age. And so he said, look, you know, if this is the case, we're going to get you tested at a very early age. We're going to provide the best testing equipment possible. And then another bill that I had passed of mine basically said, you're going to get the best care. Uh, if you all remember, uh, we were in a situation where we, had, where we were under the pandemic, and then uh, the school feeding programs came into place. Myself and Senator Stabenow introduced a bill that made it such that we transitioned into that, that we, we left a lot of that in place because we were very concerned that, that they just couldn't make the change fast enough to get back to normal. So, you know, we've been blessed. We've passed three or four bills in the last, in the last uh, several weeks. Did I answer your question? Sort of, yeah. <laughs> well, no, but, but what I'm saying is, yeah, we'll get some stuff done. Uh, Ag, I'm committed to getting the farm bill in uh, 2023 done. Senator Stabenow is too. Agriculture is not about Democrats and Republicans. It's about regions of the country. Southern agriculture is different than California. The eyes, Illinois, Iowa, Indiana, they've got their problems, the Great Plains. You work with all the stakeholders there, you put that together, and then the individual commodities, uh, corn is different than rice, uh, cotton needs different things, sugar. And so you're working with all of those. It takes the wisdom of Solomon. But yeah, that's something else that we can get done. When we go back shortly after the election, we'll pass the big, I believe we'll pass the big water resources bill. That has to do with our ports, our harbors. We're doing that every two years now. It's not glamorous, but it's the underpinning of our country. That's how our goods and products are done. So there's a lot of things like that that we'll be able to continue to get done. Just continuing on the agriculture theme, I guess, I know that you all talked about some of the student, don uh, student loan uh, relief. Uh, I saw where the USDA is giving about a billion dollars for farmers with their debt. Um, are the same criticisms for student loans, those apply there? Yeah, to be honest, I don't, they haven't re really released their criteria for how they're going to get that done. I would be critical, though, in the sense that, that if it is related to the pandemic and, you know, one farmer just pays his loan off, works hard, does a great job, Another part, a part, a farmer, two days later, takes out a loan. He gets complete forgiveness or however they're working this thing. The other farmer gets nothing. No, I don't think it's fair. And then again, if you're trying to go against people that have been discriminated against, these are people that actually got loans. I mean, wh what are you doing for those people that weren't able to get a loan because they were being discriminated against? So uh, the whole program, this is all at this at this season in the election, this is all about trying to get it, shovel as much money as you can out the door to help as many people as you can, and you hope they vote for you. So you said uh, you don't support President Biden's uh, student loan forgiveness program. Uh, that's clear. But my question would be, what do you think are some ways, or do you think it would be important to make higher education cheaper in general? Because that is the root problem. Yeah, and that's really what I was trying to say out there, that you're exactly right. When you look at the inflation rate of higher education, I'll give you an example, and these are not, not quite maybe right 
exact numbers. But when I was going through, the state paid. I, I was fortunate. I went to the University of Arkansas and had a football scholarship. Okay? But the state paid 70% of your education. You paid 30. It's reversed now. And the way they've done that, being able to do that is uh, they, they get young people. Everybody that asks for a student loan, and I had student loans when I was going through it, okay, in optometry school. So, you know, again, I worked hard. My wife, you pay them off. But, but the, uh, we've got we've to fix that so that you don't have that, that, that discrepancy. The way they can get by it now is nobody gets refused a student loan. Everybody gets it. Nobody gets counseled as to, hey, you know, do you really need this $40,000 or could you get by on 10 or 15? You know? Yeah, you can go ahead and take questions if anybody's got them. I, I guess generally, how do you feel uh, think, uh, things went today? 
Uh, pretty good. Um, of course, if you watch the debate, you notice the uh, you know the typical back and forth between Republican and Democrat, um, the constant arguing and nothing getting done. Um, you know, I want to bring change to that um, and actually progress. You know, for Americans. Yeah. Given you know, when you look at polling and look at how libertarians are, are doing gen generally, you know, it's you know, you're tra you're trailing. Uh, in, in, in the polling that we see, what gives you any realistic hope, or if, is there a realistic goal that you have for this election? Yeah, winning. Um, you know, nothing will change until the people change the way they vote. Um, if they want, if they want the continued two-party system, the back and forth, the gridlock, nothing getting done, um, the big government bureaucracy, um, you know, stepping on individual rights, you know, then just keep voting the same way you do. Um, I, I've been a conservative my whole life. I voted Republican my whole life. Um, but during COVID, when I seen, um, you know, the individual rights being taken away, um, the Afghanistan withdrawal, um, and both sides, especially, you know, so-called conservatives, not doing a thing. Um, that's when I went libertarian, because I feel they actually believe in helping people and making their lives better. Right. Anything else you'd like to follow up? No, that's it. All right. Well, just... Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I'm drinking a little associated press. Yeah, I think we, we may have talked before. Yeah, I was like, so.